My name is Midshipman First Class Adam Abraham, and I would like to welcome you to the conference's first panel. This panel will focus on Russia and China's gambit to reset the world order. Our moderator is Dr. Corey Chaki, a senior fellow and director of foreign and defense policy studies at the American Enterprise Institute. Previously, she was a deputy director general of the International Institute for Strategic Studies in London and has had a distinguished career in government working for the U.S. State Department, Department of Defense, and the National Security Council. She is a graduate of Stanford University and the University of Maryland and has taught students at the U.S. Military Academy, Johns Hopkins University's School of International Studies, and National Defense University. Please give Dr. Shaki a warm welcome. <laughs> Thank you, my friends. It is my great good fortune this morning to be the traffic cop on a conversation with an extraordinary group of talent, and I'm going to introduce them straight down this murderer's row of batters. First, Ambassador Harry Harris. He may be known to some of you as Admiral Harry Harris. Uh, what you may not, he was the ambassador to South Korea, he was the PACOM commander. Uh, it took him three major changes of his major to achieve escape velocity to graduate from this institution. Um, so welcome him back. Uh, Dr. Sally Payne, who is the uh, university professor of history and grand strategy at the Naval War College, a distinguished expert of China, also the author of From Quills to Tweets, How America uh, communicates about war and revolution. Uh, Dr. Jeffrey Mankoff, a distinguished research fellow at the, Inter at the Institute for National Strategic Studies, uh, an expert on Russia and the author of uh, Empires of Eurasia. And Elbridge Colby, a partner at the Marathon Initiative, former Deputy Secretary of State and author of Deterrence by Denial. Professor Payne, I'm going to start with you this morning. Um, so the 20th Party Congress just concluded in China. Does what you heard uh, at the Party Congress, first of all, tell us what you heard at the Party Congress, but second, does it make China more or less likely to surpass the United States as a dominant power in the international order? Surpassing what? In life's problems, in choosing a zero COVID policy that's unworkable, of shutting down its private sector, of privileging uh, the Communist Party over all others, hampering uh, economic growth for general, uh, generations, and then now potentially overextending. They've already done the Belt Road to nowhere, which now with Ukraine and Russia, I don't believe it's going anywhere, anywhere. And then it's to parts of the world that can't repay the debts. And they want to do the Taiwan event. But now, with Russia's loose, loosening grip in Central Asia, China cannot afford to ignore its boundaries. So uh, China has enormous problems. I don't know about being in any passing lane. OK. Um, and <laughs> so that's no. <laughs> Um, Ambassador Harris, is that what China looks like to the rest of Asia? Yeah, I think the rest of Asia uh, is concerned with China's rise, uh, their aggressiveness, their uh, illegal behavior throughout South and Southeast Asia, uh, and they're worried about Xi Jinping and uh, the fact that you know he's uh, now embarking on his third term uh, on the way to being president for life. Uh, so I think there's a lot of concern uh, about the, the People's Republic, uh, its intentions, uh, and how it's going to go about uh, trying to realize those intentions. I think from us, from our perspective, um, China is doing a lot of work for us that, uh, that, uh, uh, that we would otherwise have to do in convincing countries of the dangers of uh, over-partnering with China. There's nothing wrong with partnering with China. I mean. They're a big trading partner of the United States. Uh, they're the top trading partner of many, if not most, of the countries in Asia. Uh, but it's when you cede your sovereignty to the PRC that it becomes problematic. And we're seeing that play out in the Solomons. We see it play out in um, uh, Sri Lanka with uh, Ham and Toda and, and all of that. Mm -hmm. So uh, they bear watching, and I think uh, the countries in Asia, not only in Asia, but in other parts of the world, are coming to that realization now. 
Okay, so a second dour um, judgment about China. Uh, Professor, Dr. Mankoff, uh, how, how does the partnership with Russia look to Russia right now? And given that they made the commitment to, what was it, a, a partnership, partnership without boundaries um, just before Russia invaded Ukraine, and Russia proved itself the second best army in Ukraine. How's that looking for China? Does this help their mm -hmm. aspirations? I think the answer to that question is actually a little bit mixed. On the one hand, I think Russia's uh, dreadful performance in Ukraine suggests that not only on the military front, but on a lot of other fronts as well, Russia is not uh, as valuable a partner as perhaps the Chinese Communist Party had hoped before February 24th. On the other hand, Russia's done such an amazing job of isolating itself internationally, finding itself cut off from access to markets in Europe, cut off from technology transfers by the United States, that it has fewer and fewer options. And so if it's going to get access to markets, if it's going to sell its energy, if it's going to uh, buy advanced military equipment, if it's going to buy basic uh, microelectronics that it can use uh, even for dual use purposes, it's increasingly going to have to get these from China. And because Russia is a member of the UN Security Council, because it does have a, a large footprint uh, in Eurasia, but in other regions of the world as well, um, that vote, that partnership uh, can be more valuable for China simply because Russia doesn't have a choice. Uh, but it is going to be a relationship, I think, that becomes more and more one-sided. That was always uh, where this partnership seemed to be going, and I think the events of the last eight months have only accelerated that shift to a, a much more one-sided relationship. Bridge, my friend, I think you have a pretty strongly different view of China's prospects and also uh, what American policy should be uh, towards the war in Ukraine. I'm going to pitch one slow and over the plate to you since you've written widely on this. Go ahead, my friend. Sure. Thanks, Corey. Um, and I think you know the basic uh, sort of initial point I would make is that I think- Hold on just one second, Bridge. Can everybody hear him? Now, okay, please proceed. Great. Is, I mean, from what we can tell, China is, uh, you know, an economy of peer size to our own, and they are facing challenges, but bear in mind it's all a matter, sort of a relative matter. How, how significant are they compared to, to what we are? And for the first time in 150 years, the United States is dealing in the international system with an economy that by uh, some measures, approaching power parity, uh, which is you know, generally used when you're thinking about geopolitical or military issues, is already larger than we are. And I think it's often said that the Chinese are running into problems, and that seems to be true, and we'll see how the future goes. There are immense continued sources of um, Chinese uh, further development. Obviously, a, a significant part of the population remains at a relatively low level of development. Uh, and I think you know, people like the AI Commission, Bob Work and Eric Schmidt continue to point out that the Chinese are uh, actually at the forefront of human technological development in a lot of respects. So you know, when we're looking at this from a strategic perspective, I think we need to be prudent and sort of prepare for the downside risk. And in that context, I agree with Harry Harris. I, I think there's a lot uh, to be concerned about. And I'm very concerned about China's military buildup in particular, because not only is it building up a military, as Xi Jinping specifically says, to prepare for an actual war, clearly with the United States, uh, but they have incentives to do so. <coughs> as as uh, I think Dr. Payne mentioned, things like Belt and Road are not turning into dramatic, uh, you know, sort of decisive uh, political influence for them. So if they are going to achieve their their high aims, and I think they pretty clearly are, uh, they're going to have to resort to to uh, confrontation. I think you know Xi Jinping's uh, language and body language and so forth in the last few weeks is. Pretty clear in that direction. My view on Ukraine is, you know, uh, China is a far greater threat than Russia. Uh, Asia is far more important. It's the decisive theater uh, of human affairs in this day and age. And going forward, it's going to be upwards of 50 percent. I say this from Europe. Europe remains important, but it's declining to about 10 percent of global GDP over the next 20 years by its own admission. So we should support Ukraine, but we should support it consistent with a genuine prioritization of a denial defense of Taiwan, which the administration is talking about but not actually doing, as far as I can say. See, and, and that is an incredibly dangerous situation. And 
look, Admiral Gilday, the, you all know the chief of naval operations, I mean, he very publicly, he does not strike me as a fire, you know, bomb thrower, but he specifically said he did not rule out the possibility of a Chinese assault on Taiwan in the coming months. I, I, I wouldn't bet on it, but that, that certainly got my attention, and it comes on the heels of comments from Secretary of State Blinken, National Security Advisor Sullivan, a whole range of other Biden administration officials. So this is a very, very dangerous and worrying time, and I think there's a real potential that we could lose if we're not adequately prepared. So, Bridge, um, you and Oriana Schuyler Mastro wrote in the Wall Street Journal a sharper-edged uh, version of that, namely that we should let Europe handle the Ukraine war at, because we need our scarce military assets to focus on China. Are you still of that view? Yeah, I mean, that's been my view. I mean, I laid it out there, but also in a, in a uh, piece in Time magazine, I think, in, in March uh, of 2022, which is to say that Europe should take the lead. Absolutely. We're pro uh, providing a, a sort of, I would say, dramatically disproportionate amount of the financial but also military resources to Ukraine, uh, clearly, I think, at the expense of Taiwan. And that's, be that's sort of seeping out more and more. Um, we should be genuinely, especially with a flat defense budget, and I know, Corey, you've drawn attention to that, especially with a flat defense budget and a defense industrial base that's not prepared for what would almost certainly be a war of attrition at best with China. So yeah, and I, the Europeans completely have the capacity, and yet the Germans are, it looks like they may be falling back on the Zeitenwende. They're still uh, withholding significant capabilities from the Ukrainians, and then the Chancellor of Germany is going to China at the same time. So. I actually think in a lot of ways we're probably sucking up the oxygen in the room in Europe, whereas we should actually be both pressing and encouraging the Europeans to take uh, the appropriate de degree of responsibility, because clearly this war doesn't seem like it's going to, it might, I don't know, but I don't, you know, the administration is signaling that it's not going to end anytime soon, and the current, you know, imbalance vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Pacific, despite the administration's rhetoric, is incredibly dangerous. Professor Payne, how, how in your judgment would China view um, an American strategy that left Europe to the Europeans in order to focus on China? What, what do you anticipate Xi Jinping and the CCP leadership, what would they learn from that? I don't know the answer to that question, but I'm going to give you a framework for understanding the question. What we're dealing with are two continentalists, the continental powers, Russia and China, that want to have a spheres of influence world order where each rules their own sphere, whereas we're all about a maritime world order, about universal rules so that we can all trade in peace and make money. Their world order is all about, just, it, it's about conquering places, killing people to get it. You see it in real time in Ukraine, and it's, all, it, it's negative sum. You're just destroying wealth at a rapid clip. What we're doing is trying to preserve this global rule system where we negotiate with each other and determine how we're going to live with each other. And so then you're asking, okay, what's the trade-off between the Taiwan theater and the European theater? Who does what? And my answer is we all need to coordinate with each other. This is rather uh, – and uh, coordinate with each other, divide up responsibilities, but it's all elements of national power dealing with this. And it's not going to be uh, a clean – uh, we did two theaters in World War II, and I don't think we're going to be able to write off any part of the globe. Um, Dr. Mankoff, how would Russia view uh, an American strategy of the U.S. Uh, having Europeans take the lead in Europe and the U.S. focus much more, much more narrowly on China? That's been the Russian and before that Soviet dream for about three generations. Um, I think that given the role that the United States is playing is, we could call it the arsenal of democracy in Ukraine, if it were to pull out from that role to focus on Asia, it would be very hard for the Europeans to backstop it and to fill the gap that the United States has left. And that's not because Europe doesn't have the capabilities, I think it's because there's not the political unity and the political will to do that. Um, the United States, in addition to the weapons and financial assistance it's been giving to Ukraine has played an important diplomatic role in this conflict as well. And part of that is keeping the Europeans together and pushing them to do more. I think if that goes away, I think if the Europeans are left to their own devices on this, there's still going to be a lot of voices in places like Germany in particular that are going to call for some kind of a negotiated settlement that leads to a Ukraine that's to a substantial degree dismembered, but also that you're going to have a Europe itself that becomes more divided and more divisive and where Russian influence continues to gain uh, 
a hold in ways that are going to have longer term consequences for the preservation of the kind of open European and transatlantic order that we have now. Ambassador Harris, if I could draw you back to Admiral Harris's judgments, um, what do you think the Chinese are learning from <coughs> watching the war in Ukraine? Yeah, I think that uh, that's, that's a very interesting question. I, I think that uh, Xi Jinping uh, has to be thinking and learning because the PRC is a learning machine, if nothing else, uh, about the Russian experience um, uh, in Ukraine. I think he's wondering, rightly so, uh, if his army is as bad as the Russian army appears to be, um, if his generals are as bad as the Russian generals appear to be. And I have to just make a statement that there's nothing that admirals like better than criticizing generals in general. <laughs> uh, so um, he, he, has to, he has to be wondering if his Navy, the PLAN, uh, is as bad as the Black Sea Fleet appears to be. Um, he has to wonder if he can first replicate and defeat the amazing American logistics machine that allows us to get all of that stuff uh, into Ukraine. Um, I don't think that the Russian army can distinguish uh, combined arms from a rock and roll band. And, and I think he's got to be learning about what does combined arms really mean in, in war fighting. Um, and if he'd gone to the Naval Academy, he'd know that the first lesson in warfare is not to lose your flagship. And so, <laughs> he, he, so he, he's getting a free lesson in all of that by watching the Russian example. So I think that's the lessons that he's taking. Uh, I agree with uh, Bridge Colby uh, on part of what Bridge said, not everything, but the idea that, that uh, uh, I don't think that, that the PRC will invade Taiwan this year or even next year, uh, partly because of the uh, experience that Russia is having in Ukraine. Uh, I do think that the 2020s remains the decade of danger. Uh, and I think that we all ought to take Admiral Davidson's um, warning to heart. And he was my successor at Indo-PACOM, and he put a date certain on it. He put a time stamp on it that, uh, that uh, the PRC could invade Taiwan in 2027. I think that remains a benchmark, but I don't think that, that, uh, uh, that the PRC will invade Taiwan in the next year or two, in the next 20 months, given the Russian experience in Ukraine, and the PRC's own uh, economic problems uh, driven primarily by COVID and, and all of that. So subsequent to Admiral Davidson's um, judgment, both the Director of National Intelligence, Avril Haines, and the Director of Central Intelligence, Bill Burns, have both publicly endorsed that view, that is that the window of maximum vulnerability uh, for, for Taiwan is between now and 2027. Bridge, Colby, are we doing enough to prepare for that eventuality? And if not, what should we be doing that we're not doing? I, I think, and I'm, I'm looking at it from the outside, but I think the answer is no. I mean, Corey, you've been very eloquent on this point that the administration's rhetoric versus its, what it's actually resourcing, there's a, there's a mismatch. And I wrote a piece in foreign affairs uh, in August, <clears throat> trying to be empirical about this because I think there's a lot of speculation. But I mean, if we're dealing with a country that is a roughly peer economy that is increasing its level of effort on, on military forces year on year as a clear focus on the Taiwan scenario is at the forefront of human technological development in a lot of ways, you know, we could, we could see basically one of four, some, of, some of four things happening. One is an increase in the defense budget, material increase to do kind of the things that you're talking about, Corey, in Ukraine and elsewhere, but also we're not seeing that. And, and we're seeing mar relatively marginal increases put in by the Congress that are largely taken up with inflation. And your colleague, uh, Mackenzie Eaglin, has written very eloquently and persuasively about that. So we're not seeing an increase in defense spending. A second thing, we could see a dramatic, in theory, dramatic overhaul of the armed forces from one day to the next, sort of a, a little bit like what the Marine Corps, to their great credit, is doing under General Berger. We're not really seeing that. It's a relatively slow process. And a lot of what the, the defense leaders are talking about in the 2030s, which obviously the Chinese can hear, and as Admiral Harris just put it, 2027 is, you know, that's their aspiration. I, I think I'm sure he would agree. We don't know if and when they're going to go. We don't know whether they're going to go at all. But 2027, Xi Jinping has publicly indicated is the right is the time they want to have the confident ability to do so. So our timelines are messed up. 
Third, we could see a dramatic prioritization geographically in terms of the employment of the force, like what I'm one of the points I'm talking about. I mean, I mentioned all four, but you know, we're not seeing that. We've seen an elevation of US forces in Europe, uh, and that doesn't seem to be changing. Uh, and we have not, you know, the global posture review the administration conducted made essentially no changes uh, significantly. There are things apparently in train, but again, I would say too little too late. We could also see dramatic pressure on allies. We are putting pressure on Taiwan, which is good, and I encourage and support, but otherwise we're not, uh, Germany or Japan, moving very slowly. Japan's talking about 2027. So I think, you know, look, and, and Admiral Harris would know this better than I, yes, the Chinese have not had experience, et cetera. Bear in mind, the United States military, though, has, has also not had a major power war in, in a long time. And, and you know, the, uh, some of Admiral Harris's successors in the Navy leadership point out that the Navy's not able to repair ships damaged in combat. The combat logistics fleet has atrophied. I saw an article in the USNI press the other day about how um, they were doing a reload of a, of a ship, but it was at pierside because they were not comfortable doing it at sea. So this gives you a sense at one level also, Admiral Thomas, the 7th Fleet Commander, said the other day the Chinese have made material progress over the last couple of years in joint operations. They are practicing joint landing and joint blockade operations. And they have such a large missile inventory, as my friend Tom Shugart points out, as well as a, a you know, civ notionally civilian ferry group, that they could do a lot of things without being very good at joint operations. And I think the point I would say to the people out in the audience, particularly people serving in the fleet right now, is it is a really dangerous situation. And what we need to have is we need to have, we're not gonna get overmatched, but we need to have a decent margin where Xi Jinping does not think this thing could go well for him because that's gonna be a massive deterrent for him. But, and we are really messing with fate. And I think taking a cosmic roll of the dice by playing, essentially playing with fire by getting very close to this margin and possibly getting to the point where it might not even be doable. I don't think that's out of the question if we continue on the current trajectory. And that is especially discordant given that the President of the United States has four times said we'd come to Taiwan's defense. That's only responsible if we can actually do so. And that's where we're not, I think, it's not adding up to what we're, you know, we're writing checks our body can't cash, as that famous Navy movie uh, memorably put it. Thanks. Um, so the lessons I wish the Chinese were learning from the war in Ukraine are uh, you can't tell how good an army is until you fight it. So it's always an enormous measure of uncertainty to choose the use of military force to achieve your political objectives. Second, that despite the debacle of, of the departure from Afghanistan, that the United States can still rally and orchestrate America's friends and allies to common purpose. A uh, third lesson I wish the Chinese were learning is the diabolical creativity of free societies to develop new policy tools, new sanctions, new ways to weaponize the existing financial order. What I fear the Chinese actually are learning is that the United States will not risk conflict with another nuclear armed power, right? The, the hesitance to the way we rushed those 200 Florida National Guardsmen out of Ukraine as soon as Russia invaded, the fact that the president has said several times anxiously that we don't want World War III. Um, uh, so a second lesson I worry the Chinese are learning is the shallowness of the Western defense industrial base. Uh, I had uh, the Australian defense minister tell me a few months ago that the United States told them it will take seven years to replace the weapons that Australia has provided to Ukraine at our urging. Uh, so, uh, so that makes the near term a better time for China <coughs> to pr press its case on Taiwan. Uh, a third lesson I worry the Chinese are learning uh, is that um, the, the nearer to now, for all the reasons Bridge mentioned, the nearer to now and the faster they move on Taiwan, the less time the United States and its allies will have to orchestrate a response. Professor Payne, what do you think they actually are learning? The Chinese are actually learning. Uh, I'm going to go back to the macro view of the predicament they find themselves in, because I think it helps getting at your question. 
So when we look at China, we're thinking, oh, they want to make their people prosperous, the kinds of things that Western societies want to do. But it's actually the Communist Party needs, wants to maintain its monopoly on power. For a long time, economic development and that went hand in hand. But now they've reached a level of development where you've got to have a free exchange of ideas. You can't make appropriate business decisions, uh, let alone providing feedback to crazy leaders with crazy ideas. And so now it's a, a trade-off. And Xi Jinping has made clear what the trade is. He's going to do a U-turn turn back to Mao, who was one of the most incompetent uh, leaders in the field of economic development there's ever been, right? Starving 40 million of your own in a self-made famine is not the way to do things. And he's also excommunicated Deng Xiaoping and Hu Jintao, who was the last guy who oversaw double-digit growth. So you've got a, a cornered communist party. So you're going, oh, well, what's he going to learn from Ukraine? When his, I would suspect, he's looking, how, am I, how are we going to maintain the monopoly of power of the communist party? And then how are we going to glue an increasingly separated population who are appalled by the COVID lockdowns that they've had to try to live through without not food? And the answer is probably triggering the nationalism card. And so, yeah, learn from Ukraine, see the dumb things that Russia did, try not to do those, and then Taiwan comes later. The happy news about Chinese naval purchases is they're based on Russian stuff, a lot of it, which would be a good thing. And um, they've mixed and matched a lot of things on their platform. So who knows how they actually work when you try to use them. Mm. Uh, Dr. Menkov, how, how do you see that I mean, if, if China's military is built on Russian equipment, this isn't a banner marketing, um, Ukraine isn't a banner marketing campaign for Russian equipment. Are we at risk of over-criticizing Russia's potential military power? Yes and no. <clears throat> I think, you know, look, despite all of the tactical and operational failures that we've seen on the part of the Russian military. They still are entrenched in around 20% of Ukraine. And it's gonna be very difficult for the Ukrainians to dislodge them absent some kind of larger political or social upheaval in Russia. Um, this is the Russian way of war. This has been the Russian way of war for centuries. You throw <coughs> mass at a problem you accept large amounts of casualties, both among civilian populations and among your own soldiers. But in the process, you overwhelm, you hold territory, and you fight until the other side's will to continue the fight breaks. Now, we don't know if they're gonna ultimately be successful in that. I think it's possible that the, the will on the Russian side, especially now that you have large numbers of conscripts uh, who are being called in, not given training and being thrown into the front lines, how long uh, they're gonna be willing to, to sustain this. But nevertheless, um, I think that despite the losses they've taken so far, Russia is still <coughs> significant amounts of territory, and it's going to be very hard for Ukraine to push them out. So I think that you know, we can be critical of Russia's military technical capability, we can be critical of its leadership, we can be critical of its doctrine, we can be critical of its morale, but at the end of the day, I still think there's a reasonable prospect for Russia coming out of this conflict, having achieved at least some semblance of the military ends that it's <coughs> that it set itself when it went into this conflict. And uh, I'd love to talk a little bit about the end games of the war in Ukraine and what it means for international order. Because it looks unlikely that Russia can succeed. I mean, they've had to fall back on their political objectives a couple of times now. And my nightmare scenario is that as the Russian army is slowly pushed out of Ukrainian territory, that uh, Vladimir Putin could see an end game that works for him, and that would be the use of a nuclear weapon against the civilian population of Kiev, after which he can claim he destroyed the government, achieved regime change, and Russia can now leave. Am I wrong to be worried about that? How likely? Do you view that possibility, <laughs> and what should we do about it? Mm -hmm. Fortunately, I'm not a gambling man, so I don't want to, to give odds. I think that the concern about nuclear use in the event that the Putin leadership sees its military operations, the front collapsing, is not entirely impossible. 
Um, I don't think it's particularly likely, but I, not particularly likely is not the same as, as impossible. Um, were it to happen, I think a strike on Kiev would probably be less likely than some other contingencies, in part because ultimately at the end of this, Russia's goal is to control Kiev. They see Kiev as being sort of the heart of this all-Russian nation that Putin has talked about in a lot of his articles and speeches. And so much better for them if they have the city intact. That doesn't mean they would never flatten it. We've certainly seen them flatten a lot of cities, but I don't think that that would be their um, you know, first choice. Um, whether or not that happens, I think, depends, of course, what happens on the ground in Ukraine, but it also depends on what our reaction is and what the messaging that we're sending to the Russians throughout this conflict is. And so far, I think we've been pretty good about communicating very clearly that um, the use of a nuclear weapon in any capacity, or even, as we're hearing about now in the, in the most recent news reports, the potential launching of a dirty bomb uh, in Ukraine will have very profound consequences for Russia, including military consequences. And what is being reported in, in public is not detailed, but we're definitely <coughs> hearing that. The messages that are being communicated to the Russians through the various diplomatic and military channels are very specific about the kinds of consequences that Russia could face. And I think maintaining that message and maintaining uh, consistency in that messaging and maintaining unity among the allies and communicating that message is going to remain very important to help deter the kind of contingencies that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. I was in Ukraine about a month ago, and I was struck at the consistency with which business leaders, civil society people, and the government's reaction to Western concern about nuclear use by the Russians was a consistent, it won't change the outcome, it will only change the cost, which strikes me, which first of all is incredibly courageous, but also strikes me as the right way to um, devalue nuclear threats on the parts of the on the part of the Russians, Ambassador Harris. How do you think um, the countries of Asia would respond to a war termination scenario in which Russia loses but loses along the terms of my nightmare? Yeah, I, I think that um, uh, our friends, allies, and partners in Asia are watching the Russia-Ukraine case closely, and, but more closely they're watching how the U.S. responds. Um, and if they perceive um, a weakness or if they perceive um, um, a lack of willingness to continue to provide the support we're providing, and if, if in so doing Russia then um, seizes the advantage, uh, I think they'll begin to question um, their own relationship with the United States. And I think our adversaries in Asia will also watch that closely, namely uh, Kim Jong-un and Xi Jinping. Um, Kim Jong-un, uh, I think the lesson that he's taking from the Russia-Ukraine conflict uh, is that nuclear weapons matter. Uh, and the idea that he'll somehow voluntarily give up his nuclear program is, is the height of naivete in my opinion. Um, and so uh, that's, that's the lesson that he's taking from it. Whether it's the right lesson or the wrong lesson, that's the lesson I believe that he's taking from, uh, from the conflict. So um, our actions in Ukraine, now more than ever, uh, because we've been at it now for uh, over eight months, uh, matters, uh, matter to, to our friends, allies, partners, and adversaries in Asia who are watching that very closely. Bridge, how do you think the nuclear part of the equation works in the Ukraine war? I mean, Russia is clearly making those threats. Um, my guess is partly because their army isn't succeeding, also because Western supplies to Ukraine are such a consequential part of, of Ukraine's military success. How do you see nuclear elements playing out? What should American policy be? to diminish the likelihood of Russian nuclear use. Well, thanks, and apologies, I had to step out for a second. I'm just having a little medical thing, but all okay here. So, um, but I would say what? that it's... Um, okay, wait uh, a minute. <laughs> <laughs> I'm all okay. It's all okay. I don't want to go into it, but I'm <laughs> fine. <laughs> so, um, uh, I, I mean, I, look, I think the, the, the potential for Russian nuclear use is, is real. I mean, I think as Jeff uh put it um it's 
you know, I mean, the Russians have developed a very large nuclear arsenal. They have exercised it. I infer from that they take it seriously. They're in the kind of situation that, you know, when people like us have, have participated in these war games and so forth over the years, this is the kind of set of conditions where you could imagine it being plausible. I mean, I think the administration's public messaging actually on this has been quite good, I would say. Um, it's be, it, it seems to be somewhat ambiguous, but also sharp. And I don't know what they're messaging internally that, or kind of privately that Jeff referred to. But that, that actually, you know, but to their credit, I think they've taken the escalation uh, scenario seriously, which I think they, they should. At the same time, your point, Corey, I think is, is actually the right one which is the ultimate way is to, even if the Russians do it, make sure that they don't benefit. I, I do think we want to avoid World War III, and I'm very cautious about that. I'm against, you know, I'm, I wouldn't necessarily recommend the U.S. government say this, but I'm against fighting a war with the Russians over Ukraine. I think we made the right decision not to become directly involved, not to have a no-fly zone. I think if we get in a war with the Russians in Ukraine, we have to probably assume that it will go nuclear. That doesn't mean the end of the world. But, you know, the Russians, especially at this point, really aren't capable of fighting the United States and NATO without nuclear weapons. So I think, you know, what we want is actually in that kind of situation, we want to make it clear to the Russians that they won't gain, but it also won't lead to this kind of escalatory spiral that I think is very, very real. That potential is very real. I mean, Jeff said it's not likely, but it's, you know, low impact, high probability event. But I think that in that kind of situation, we would want to strengthen, you know, make sure the Ukrainians are in a stronger position that they can keep going. Um, and, uh, and that the Russians don't gain, obviously, international sanctions and increased international isolation. But I mean, look, the reality is I think there's a lot of, uh, you know, rhetoric in, in, in the, you know, public conversation that kind of discounts nuclear weapons. But, you know, Corey, I know you studied under Tom Schelling, uh, you know, I mean, the nuclear revolution is a real thing. And the reality of it is that, you know, you have to take the, even a, a, a loathsome and opprobrious government like the Russian government, you have to sort of take it as a reality that it has the ability to do the worst kind of harm to us. So we should be front-loading that thinking. Again, that doesn't mean, you know, stopping the Ukrainians. The Ukrainians should keep going. That's great. But it does mean that we have to, you know, because once that happens, we're in a whole new world, and mm -hmm. that we want to make sure that the Russians basically don't benefit from it. Thanks. Sally, can I ask you, what would be the ideal end of the war in Ukraine for managing China's challenges? That is, what's the European outcome, the restoration of security in Europe that would best advantage American interests for the management of China? Well, first of all, this war, uh, the global order is at stake in this war. And then the question is strategy. We're a maritime power, so we do not have to go toe to toe, whereas Ukraine had no choice. When the army comes, you either capitulate or you fight. So it's a major issue of strategy. Uh, you've got, Putin has self put himself on death ground, that he's just in a corner. He has put the Ukrainian government on death ground saying, I'm gonna annihilate you. He has put the Ukrainian people on death ground saying, I'm gonna eliminate you as a people. And then he's putting the global order on death ground. So our counter strategy to this, the last thing you wanna do is put the Russian people on death ground because that will glue them to Putin. And that's the last thing you want to have happen. The optimal thing, I trust we have aggressive telephone calls the way we did in Ser Serbia to all of Putin's uh, inner circle, outer circle, et cetera. The optimal thing is obviously a coup in there where someone says, uh, Vlad, it's been great. Here's the dacha for you. <laughs> and then there, there are possibilities for doing a walk back. Barring that, I don't see a walk back. So then the question is, uh, how this how to stay in, uh, keep the thing from going nuclear, and eventually the man will die. But he's very good at staying in power. Isn't this his core capability? He's very good at it. Mm -hmm. So we're in a, a dark place. And uh, one of the greatest strengths of this country has been our maritime shield, that we've had sanctuary at home. We play our cards wrong on this one, and there's a nuclear strike on a US city. city. Look how nuts we are about wearing masks. I mean, what a stupid event. It hardly, it's just a minor thing, and we're all going crazy about that. If there's a nuclear strike on one of our cities. Rational discourse in this country will be in deep, dark trouble. So it would be uh, not sending American troops, keeping the Ukrainians in there for the long game. And um, they may well get a, a, a route of Russian forces.
where if, if you study the Korean War, uh, we got, well, the uh, North Koreans got way down to the south and they were routed all the way back up. Um, past the 38th parallel, we got all the way up to the Yalu River, we were routed all the way back. There are wars where there are massive troop movements. So that may well be in our future, in the not too distant future. Jeff, let me ask you, do you think we have a Vladimir Putin problem or a Russia problem? I think we have both. And they're not exactly the same. Because I think that the general sense that Russia is a great imperial power that has some kind of right to dominion, if not right to rule, over significant parts of the former Soviet Union is pretty widespread within the Russian elite, um, within public opinion. Uh, Russia is a country that, unlike a lot of Western European countries, never really went through the transition from empire to nation state. And in part because of that, I think there is this general assumption that Russia remains something beyond a territorially bounded state and that it maintains a right to have some kind of, of influence over its neighbors regardless of whether people in those neighboring states uh, want the Russians to be there or not. Now, how that gets operationalized is a problem of politics and political leadership and this is where I think Putin matters because all of these attitudes ha have been there from the beginning. There was maybe a brief period in the early 1990s when Yeltsin was surrounded by um, the Western-leaning economic technocrats where the priorities were elsewhere. But for a significant part of Russia's post-Soviet history, this kind of mindset has been there. But it's been pursued in a kind of cautious, institutional, bureaucratic way relying on a certain amount of coercion, but uh, in ways that are designed to remain below the threshold of triggering a, a major crisis. So there have been small-scale Russian military interventions. There's been a lot of uh, what scholars now talk about as sharp power being pr projected in places like uh, Central Asia or uh, in Ukraine uh, up until uh, 2014. But Putin, and especially the Putin that has come into being since COVID pandemic, uh, one who's isolated, who is isolating himself, uh, something we were talking about with Xi Jinping, from competing sources of ideas, competing sources of influence, and who has this own, who has this sense of his own kind of world historical role. You know, he talks about himself as the heir to Peter the Great and Catherine the Great. Um, that's a very idiosyncratic, personalistic piece of this problem. And if that goes away, Putin goes away, we're still going to have the Russia problem, but it may be one that can be managed in a more, uh, in, in a less fraught, less dangerous way. Let me ask you one other question on a related subject. Given the excellence of your scholarship about Central Asia and uh, imperial shadows, if Russia loses in Ukraine, does that create the prospect of um, usurpation of Russian power in other places in Central Asia, mm -hmm. places that Russia thinks of as Russia but that might not think of themselves. I'm thinking of the Azerbaijani statement mm -hmm. yesterday. So I think, and th this is particularly true of, of Putin, but I think this is a, a broader phenomenon in that the Russian leadership and, and Russians in general don't view the entire post-Soviet Union as being the same. Uh, Ukraine, Belarus, uh, maybe Moldova, northern Kazakhstan where there's a large Slavic population, those have more resonance, more historical, cultural uh, importance than do places like Azerbaijan uh, or Central Asia. So the Russian footprint in these latter areas uh, has been retreating pretty steadily since the end of the Cold War and the end of the Soviet Union. Much of what is still there is vestigial. Um, mm. There are Russian mm. troops uh, in Tajikistan, for instance, who've been there since, well, since the Soviet Union, but they were reinforced in the 1990s because of Tajikistan's civil war. Um, there are Russian troops uh, in Armenia who are there as a legacy of the, the first war <coughs> in the war of in the early 1990s. But what you're seeing in most of these places is that the people themselves are de-Russifying over time. So you have younger generations in many of these countries that don't grow up speaking Russian, don't get their news from Russian television, don't travel to Russia unless they're going as migrant laborers uh, where their experiences tend not to be very good and don't leave them with 
you know, warm feelings about Russia. Uh, and where the economic patterns are shifting so that Russia's economic footprint in a lot of these places is diminishing over time, uh, largely to the benefit of China, but not only. So I think all else being equal, over time you're going to see Russian influence in places like Central Asia, Azerbaijan weaken. And in some ways this war is accelerating that process. I mean, you mentioned the statement from, from the Azerbaijani leadership, we've seen the Kazakh leadership. Uh, which was bailed out by Russia uh, as recently as January, uh, making very strong statements about remaining neutral in this conflict. Um, so I, I think the Russians have essentially made a bet that they want to reinforce, retake control in Ukraine, even if it means sacrificing a lot of the influence that they have been able to maintain in some of these other places. Mm -hmm. And I think win or lose uh, in Ukraine, that's a, a process that we're gonna see continuing. Interesting. So Harry, I have such admiration for the breadth of your strategic thought. <laughs> and um, do, you set up. <laughs> do you see uh, cooperation, uh, how significant do you see the fingerprints of potential cooperation? The fact that the Chinese who in their foreign policy have been so strident about uh, sovereignty and uh, <coughs> refusing to condemn Russia's invasion. The Iranians coming on side, not just with drones, but with technicians in Ukraine. Um, do, are we in American strategy underestimating the potential of our adversaries coalescing? And if so, what should we do about that? Yeah, I, I think it's a recent phenomenon. I don't know that from the American strategic perspective if we're underestimating them yet, but we, we would do so at our peril should we underestimate it. There's, there's the old saw that, that Russia and, and China are never true allies because they share such a long border and, and they have contentious views of communism and Marxist-Leninism and all of that. But I think that the circumstances in the world today are driving them together. And for the near term, uh, it's an issue that we have to be concerned about. Uh, I think the Iranian peace is interesting. It's, it's an, another indication uh, of, um, of um, people who view the United States and the West as enemies coming together. Uh, the Iranian uh, case of the drones and the technicians uh, in Ukraine is troubling. Uh, and uh, we ought to do something about that. Uh, and, uh, but I, I am worried about the, the, the seeming co uh, coalescing uh, of the relationship across all dimensions uh, between Russia um, and the People's Republic today. I can't resist asking you, given your time as ambassador in South Korea, this looks like a free play day for North Korea. They're firing missiles, um, doing tests. Uh, are they benefiting from our focus elsewhere? And we perennially say that we, Russia and China, have a common interest in preventing nuclearization of North Korea. Yeah. That does not appear to no. be how Russia and China view this problem. Yeah, uh, I, I don't think that uh, uh, China views uh, the necessity to, for the North to denuclearize like we do, I, I think that they don't think it's necessary at all. Uh, the North Korea has always provided China uh, a relief valve when pressures from the United States became um, uh, overburdensome. Uh, whether you want to talk about what's going on now uh, globally and our actions against uh, the PRC in economic spheres or you want to talk about the pressures that we place to try to place uh, on the PRC for climate change and, and these issues, uh, North Korea provides a useful uh, relief valve uh, that draws our attention uh, uh, away from demanding certain things uh, of Beijing uh, and acquiescing probably in other areas uh, in that regard. Uh, I think that the Kim Jong-un, uh, the chairman in, in, uh, in, in North Korea, he, he wants four things. He's one of these four things uh, for years, and that's uh, sanctions relief. He wants to keep his nukes. Um, he wants to split the alliance and then dominate the peninsula. Uh, 
And I think that those, that view has, has, uh, has been unchanged for him for years. Uh, and this idea that we could uh, somehow uh, entice him to denuclearize uh, again, as I said earlier, is, is naive. Uh, and I think the Ukraine example demonstrates to him uh, the, the, uh, the necessity to keep his nuclear program active and growing and, and viable. Mm -hmm. um, polls about South Korean support for renuclearizing the southern part yeah. of the Korean Peninsula. Does that, does that make you rethink the American decision of the early 90s to remove American no, weapons from No, there? not at all. And, um, and I addressed this issue when I was the ambassador uh, in Seoul. Uh, so there is a move uh, by um, certain elements of the South Korean population uh, that we should bring tactical nuclear weapons back to Korea. Uh, there's another uh, similar uh, um, uh, uh, body of support uh, in the South Korean um, uh, people uh, that they should nuclearize themselves uh, as a hedge against North Korea uh, and really uh, because of lack of faith uh, in, the, in the alliance's ability and America's ability to provide extended deterrence to them. And we see that play out to some degree in Japan uh, and in other countries. Uh, and I believe, uh, and I've said this publicly, that we are a signatory to the nuclear uh, uh, non-proliferation movement as is South Korea, as is Japan, uh, and that means something. So uh, we don't want to see other countries nuclearize, if you will. Uh, and we have uh, promised South Korea uh, in the strongest terms uh, possible that we would extend our strategic deterrent capability to them uh, as an alliance partner. Now, it's on them whether they believe that or not. And it's on us to continue to convince them of the efficacy and the veracity uh, of, of our position that we will defend you, one, to the last American, and two, uh, through nuclear uh, weapons if necessary. But they have to believe it. And if we falter on our part of the deal, then, then, then those elements in South Korea and other places that argue for their own indigenous nuclear program uh, will win out. Sally, how do you think regional nuclear issues play out in Chinese thinking? Um, what do you think their judgment is about North, Koreans, North Korea's nuclear program, North Korea's missile tests? Are the, is that helpful to them? Uh, does it worry them that Japan and South Korea um, might make different choices, uh, nuclear choices themselves, given that they're both nuclear countries that could make that choice, that is, they have the technical and material capability. How do you think that potential cascade plays in Chinese thinking? Well, the Chinese are some of the greater proliferators out there. I mean, think about whom they've helped to get nuclear weapons, right? North Korea and Pakistan. Uh, it's, in fact, they got more nuclear power sitting on their borders than anybody else does. In fact, Khrushchev had thought uh, maybe letting Cubans have certain control over weapons was viable until he decided that was one of the stupidest ideas that he ever had come up with, and the Russians have never done that since. So the Chinese have already let the cat out of the bag, right, because it's got these nuclear neighbors, terribly unstable places. Oh, and weak governments, you think that, oh, I can push them around because they're weak. Well, actually, if they're on death ground, i.e., the, the leader in question feels that their existence is on the line, you may have exactly zero leverage over that person. And that's where China sits with Kim and um, uh, Pakistan. And of course the Chinese care deeply about what goes on in uh, Japan and Korea. It's like the fact that because of World War II, Koreans and Japanese have trouble talking to each other, but China, by being such an aggressive threat, is mending those fences for us. In fact, this is where China and Russia's it's self-defeating strategy. They're the incredible sanction magnets, the people who strengthen the alliances of others. So that's a key for us to consider in our own foreign policy is, okay, we have these massive threats. 
This is an incredible opportunity for institution building of all kinds. It's an incredible opportunity now in Asia, which lacks the um, extensive security architecture that Europe's got to be building it piece by piece. So it's, it's a threat, but it comes with an opportunity. Very interesting. Bridge, I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts on what US policy should be to try and drive Russia and China apart. Um, it, that is the inverse of the question of are we worried enough, which is uh, what tools are available to us to aggravate Russian and Chinese cooperation? Uh, well, that, that's a good question. Uh, I would uh, draw your attention to a good article by, a uh, very good article by Dmitry Alperovich and Sergei Rodchenko in Foreign Affairs about a month ago or so, pointing out um, that that should remain our goal or should increasingly be our goal, uh, but that we probably have limited leverage in the nearer term. I mean, I don't think anybody's, uh, you know, thinking that we're going to persuade Putin or really should realistically, uh, given the, the lay of the land. Now, you know, one of, the, one of the things that might emerge in a future Russian leader, even one that is uh, uh, sort of from the same crowd as Putin, is there may be incentives, given how disastrously the war has gone for Russia, to disassociate him or herself from, from that conflict. Um, I mean, in the way that, you know, you could see, and Jeff would know this better than I, but the, the fall of Khrushchev after the several years after the Cuban Missile Crisis was, you know, connected to the disapproval in the in the Soviet elite about that whole thing, and I guess the Berlin crises, and at least for some time led Brezhnev, who was, you know, a, not a nice guy, uh, to to detente. Obviously, the story goes on, but I think that's a an opportunity, um, especially the point that you know clearly the Russians are the junior partner, and I agreed with Jeff's assessment that that China's sort of it's a mixed picture how Russia has gone, because now Russia is, is really dependent on China. And I think it probably exacerbates the simultaneity problem uh, that if the Chinese did decide to go uh, over Taiwan, and of course that, that initial attack might be much larger since they seem to assume that, that the United States would come to Taiwan's defense at this point, I think probably rightly, um, then, then the Chinese will have more leverage over Putin to, to create a simultaneous problem, as well as, as you're pointing out, Corey, the potentially the Iranians and then Harry as well, and the North Koreans. There's there's a lot of leverage, and there may be gain in there. Um, but to me, to come back, to, this is the necessity of choice and making our strategy actually consistent with our resources and our level of willpower. And it's a point that you made very articulately in the New York Times, that our, our rhetorical strategy is way ahead of our resources and what we're prepared to do. And that's, you know, it, it's possible that the Chinese, A, never do anything. B, it's possible that they prove to be as... Uh, you know, uh, you know, three feet tall uh, instead of seven feet tall, as as I might uh, suggest they they are, but I don't think that's the right bet. Mm -hmm. Excellent. So I'm just about to go to the audience to give you all your chance to be in conversation with these four excellent thinkers on this subject. But before I do, I'd love to go uh, the rest of the way down the row. Any levers U.S. policy should be hitting to manage the potential of Russian and Chinese collusion? Jeff? Hmm. I, I agree that it's going to be very difficult because both Russia and China look at their partnership, right? I should say the Russian leadership and the Chinese leadership look at their partnership right now in almost existential terms, that whatever other problems they may have with one another, they don't see each other as threatening the survival of the regime. And they see that the United States and what the United States is doing as posing a threat to the survival of the regime. So they have every incentive to hang together rather than hang separately. Um, over the longer term, I mean, I think there are probably some things that we could do. Um, you know, as uh, the, the CHIPS Act and the sanctions on, on China bite over the longer term, because Russia's being increasingly cut off from other sources of high technology, that's going to have an impact on the Russians as well. Um, if they want to, uh, break out and, and actually access some of these things, they may have to find a way to make deals with, with partners other than China. Uh, so I think in this way, you know, hurting the, the Chinese tech sector is also going to have uh, secondary effects on Russia. Um, you know, um, I think uh, taking steps to, to weaken the Russian energy industry, which is something that we're also doing, um, making uh, less cheap Russian energy available to China, 
uh, over time, even as we're trying to take that energy off of global markets. I mean, I think mm. again, then that removes some of the, the points of, of uh, convergence between the two. But all of these are longer term uh, prospects, and I don't think there is much that we can do in, in the short term. Sally? Um, Russia and China, I, I agree with your argument, but over the long term, uh, it's, a non, it, it's a non-workable partnership. Currently, you're going to have Russia probably trying to reroute energy to sell to China, and that'll take them a number of years, and who knows if they can get the technology to do it. It's incredibly inefficient for them because Europe's a better market. Those sorts of things will go on. But historically, both of them are scared to death of each other, and for years, Russia worked to delay the rise of China, and obviously it failed, but it, was, it started with the first Sino-Japanese War, and you had the scramble of concessions that hamstrung Chinese foreign policy for two generations. Well, that begins with Russia doing things. Russia set up a, a united front between communists and, and uh, nationalists so that they would fight Japan, and so Russia wouldn't face a two-front war, and you have uh, Stalin fighting the last uh, Chinese in Korea, and then you have, in the uh, later parts of the Cold War, a tremendous competition over who's going to get what allies or friends in Africa and other places. So their under, uh, underlying relationship is absolutely adversarial, and there's major racism that goes on in Russia and China. That's a whole other feature of it. So yeah, in the short term, when they're backed in the corner, yes. But are they really going to do the kind of cooperation, if you think about uh, what went on in, in uh, the, the Western uh, democracies in World War II and then in the Cold War, I just don't see it happening. And this is the silver lining with these horrible authoritarian regimes. They're all about number one. And it's, uh, they look at the world as being zero sum, either I get it or you get it and not in the win-win mode of this maritime order that we're trying to preserve. So yeah, it's incredibly dangerous. I don't know how it's going to turn out. No idea whether someone's going to lob a nuke. If they do, our world's going to change in ways that we can't anticipate. Harry, levers? Yeah, so um, the, one of the things that we could do to, to uh, uh, reinforce the levers of influence uh, with regard to uh, the PRC and Russia uh, is to eliminate our own say-do mismatch. And you pointed this out very uh, succinctly in your article uh, about the resources versus rhetoric mismatch. And, and so words matter. Uh, I, you know, I always say the words matter, diplomats matter, and diplomacy matters. Um, and so we have this say-do mismatch. Uh, that uh, provides uh, an ample breeding ground uh, for uh, aggressive behavior uh, on the part of uh, despots around the world. Uh, so we need to eliminate that. Um, you know, one of the one of the things that that Putin miscalculated on in in the Ukraine instance was the bringing together of the things that he was opposed to uh, all along, which is the U.S the UN, uh, the, uh, uh, the EU, and NATO. Now, we don't have an EU or NATO or even an equivalent in Asia, so, uh, but we do have rhetoric mismatches there. We have this issue with Taiwan, uh, which countries like Russia and, and obviously the PRC and many others are watching closely, where the president says, and he said it four times this year, that we will defend Taiwan, and each time he said it, somebody in Washington, whether it's the State Department, the National Security Council, uh, or the Defense Department, have walked it back. So it creates this sense of who's in charge in Washington. Is it the, the, uh, the elected president, or is it the non-elected, non-Senate-confirmed staffers? Uh, and I think it makes us look feckless, uh, and I think we need to uh, 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 to come on the side of strategic clarity with regard to, to Taiwan. No, we need to prepare to do what the president, the commander in chief, has said four times this year. So that, that framework is being examined closely uh, by Russia and the PRC and others. Do we do what we say we're going to do? Are we going to extend deterrence to our allies uh, in Asia? Uh, are we going to continue 
uh, or are we going to continue to be ambiguous? You know, a strategic, a strategic ambiguity only works if you know in advance the answer is no. And we were completely clear uh, in Ukraine. We will not send U.S. troops there. As a matter of fact, we'll pull out the few hundred troops that we have there. Thank you very much, said Putin, and then he went. So uh, we need to be clear with regard to our intentions in Taiwan. And, and that's one of the things that would, that's one of the levers, I think, uh, that would demonstrably affect uh, the, the, the China-Russia-Iranian uh, alignment. Thank you. Well, this is a fascinating conversation. We're going to expand it now with audience questions. We'll take them from both our virtual audience and our in-person audience here in the auditorium. I ask you, if you're in the auditorium, to come down to the microphones, state your name, and please ask a question and get to your question quickly. I'll start over here with Lieutenant Kyle Craig. Thank you, uh, Lieutenant Kyle Craig, Service Warfare Officer. Uh, thank you for your time and expertise. Uh, there's a story from the Washington Post during the third Taiwan Strait crisis where a PLA general lectured a senior Clinton official that three times during the 1950s, you, the United States, threatened to nuke China because we could not hit you back, and now we can, and we think you won't trade attacks on Los Angeles for Taipei. So as we look now at the world's largest Navy, uh, modernized PLA 25 years hence, and in the area of concern, <coughs> What causes you the greatest fear about our ability to prevail in a conflict near term with China? Do you want to direct who should answer? Or would you like me to? Uh, let me start with Admiral Harris. Yeah, it, it's, it's a good question, but I'm not sure that the trading uh, nuclear attacks uh, on Taipei or LA is, is really the issue. I think Beijing and, and other cities in the PRC would factor into that, that uh, decision matrix. But, but I think, though, that the uh, uh, the, 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 the issue at hand, what keeps me awake when I think about it, though I don't think about it too much, so I don't have too much trouble falling asleep <laughs> these days, but, but I think the issue is what would, what would cause the PRC to attack Taiwan, and then what would cause us to either respond or not respond? Um, and so. And that goes back to what I said earlier. We have a, a, a deeds to, to, to rhetoric mismatch. And as long as that uncertainty uh, exists and grows or is reinforced uh, by people who are unelected in Washington, uh, then that creates an opportunity uh, for the PRC to move. Uh, I think that they fear strategic clarity uh, and they welcome strategic ambiguity. Uh, and, and if you listen to Xi Jinping, not only uh, during his uh, election this time to his third term, but in the past and other serious Chinese thinkers, uh, they have been strategically clear for decades. It is us who have been strategically ambiguous. Uh, and I think that that is going to create an opening uh, for the PRC to move in. Any of the other panelists want if to I, take that question? Yeah, uh, Rich? if I could jump in, uh, thanks. I mean, I guess I'm, I'm, what worries me most is that they might be able to start a war and plausibly win. I mean, based on the analysis that we're seeing in the open source, I mean, the, you know, basically, I mean, the, the, the advantages that they have of scale, sophistication, focus, proximity, and the potential to generate sufficient surprise, not technically, not total surprise, but within our OODA loop, means that you know, even if they don't perform that effectively, they could essentially saturate the problem. I mean, Rand, almost 10 years ago in its scorecard report, pointed out that they could shut down US bases uh, throughout the Western Pacific for weeks, maybe longer on end, with you know, munitions and then service them with other kinds of capabilities. And you know, we know they're practicing get cutouts of US ships tied up at the pier side in, in Japanese ports, which tells you they're thinking of attacking preemptively. Uh, and they're using the same thing against Japanese self-defense forces capabilities. And the Taiwanese are, are lagging dramatically. And so, you know, I mean, this is an economy 10 times the size. And what I'm afraid of is that they are, would establish conventional dominance. Uh, and then they'd push the nuclear burden of escalation onto us. So it's uh, we who have to, you know, and I think it was Chaz Freeman who, who responded, you know, but basically at that time, people like Walt Slocum and Chaz, we had nuclear dominance and conventional dominance. That's a very attractive situation. The Chinese are on their way to potentially ga gaining at least conventional dominance and a sort of parity situation. And there, there's a, you know, 
again, I don't make any predictions. I have no idea what's in Xi Jinping's head. But there's a range of, of signals that we're seeing, indicators, the massive conventional military buildup, as Admiral Aquilino, Admiral Harris's successor points out, the unprecedented historic military buildup, dual circulation designed to deal with uh, the sanctions problem, blocking Communist Party members from having outside financial accounts, COVID lockdowns, which also function as social control, and, by the way, a massive nuclear buildup, which for years, Beijing specifically linked its nuclear restraint to its political restraint, as it did with overseas bases. It's now blown through that. They are not worried that we're launching a, a surprise nuclear attack. They have the capability to deter that. What they built is a theater force and a, a, a more precise force that would be able to go up the nuclear ladder. Why would you need that? Because you think you're going to fight a large conventional war under the nuclear shadow with the Americans. That's a very costly signal, again, that they are taking this very, very seriously. And again, we really won't have much warning, probably, because they're not dumb. And if they give us warning, we'll be more prepared. And so this is the thing, is it could happen very suddenly. It could happen in five years. It could happen in eight years. But here's the other thing. It's going to take years for us to rectify the problem. Corey mentioned the Australians. We're not much better in the defense industrial base. You know, I mean, we are in really bad shape. So we need to act like we're, you know, on a burning, in a burning building right now, you know, in order to fix a problem five years from now. So that's, that's a big part of the, the reason that I'm concerned. And I guess the one difference I would have with Admiral Harris is I'm less concerned with talking the talk now. I'm more concerned about walking the walk. I'm really not persuaded that we're doing it. And I think, honestly, it's you guys in the audience. I, I don't I, I regret I can't be there in person. But people who are particularly the Naval, the Air Force, the Marines, that are going to be on the front end of this. And we need to put ourselves in a situation where you guys have the best, you're in the best footing possible. And we're spreading the peanut butter around. This say do gap is completely correct. Um, but you know, even if we double the defense budget tomorrow, which we're not going to do realistically, it would take years for this problem to, to remediate. And we don't have years. And so we need to be realistic and clear right now. And, and I, unfortunately, I don't think that's what's happening. The next question comes from uh, our online audience. Renee Ananow asks, to Bridge's point earlier, if a NATO versus Russia conflict inevitably involves chemical, biological, radiological, nuclear use by Putin, do NATO precision capabilities in conventional space dominate nuclear systems? Are we approaching another 1991-style revolution in military affairs? I'll direct it to Jeff first, and then maybe Sally can take it, and then Bridge, if you have uh, thoughts at the end. Yeah, I, I don't have a lot of insight on this. I think that, you know, in general, the, the U.S. And, and NATO as a whole are far ahead in conventional and especially precision, precision strike capabilities. And we've seen the failure of Russia to build those uh, at scale in, in the war in Ukraine, which is why they've relied so heavily on, on dumb weapons. So I, I think a conventional conflict between Russia and NATO or some subset of NATO would be very bad for Russia, um, which then raises the question of, you know, would in that scenario Russia escalate to some kind of non-conventional weapons use? Um, the question of whether NATO has the capabilities to stop or suppress uh, that use beforehand, I don't know. Uh, I think certainly the capabilities are there to respond afterwards in a conventional way uh, that would uh, create uh, enormous costs for Russia. And that's the conversation that's being had with Moscow now about the potential for the use of unconventional weapons, chemical or uh, nuclear in Ukraine. I'm not an expert on the topic, I'll pass. Okay. Uh, Bridge, do you want to jump on that one at all? Well, I'll just say that I, no, I don't think, uh, with all thanks for the question, I would say nuclear weapons are still dominating because of the, the degree of destruction they can ultimately uh, create. Uh, next question, a midshipman down here in front. Uh, midshipman, third class, Marin Kovic. Uh, thank you all for the engaging discussion. Uh, this is for any of you to answer. Uh, stemming from the Cold War, the U.S.'s uh, history with Pakistan and Russia with India, um, with the changing dynamic in the region, how do you see these relationships as well as the fact that both are nuclear uh, possession countries? Uh, how will that affect the U.S. policy as they move into the Indo-Pacific region? Thank you. I can Sally? do that one. Okay. <laughs> Our problem with India and Pakistan in the Cold War 
were that they were each other's primary adversaries for a good part of it. And so we wanted to have good relations with both, and it wrecked our relations with both because you give aid to one, the other one's apoplectic, vice versa. But through China's brilliant foreign policy of stirring things up with India, which was totally unnecessary, China's India's primary adversary, and that's certainly true now. And uh, India's at a crossroads, it's gotten a lot of, it's had very good relations with Russia all during the Cold War. And got a lot of his military equipment there, and now it's just recently canceled a contract because uh, the observation is the equipment isn't doing so well in the field, <laughs> right? And so India is going through a major reassessment, and uh, the prospects for us of dealing, of having ever more cordial relations with them, is better and better, and that's where you get the Quad, which would be unthinkable 20 years ago. So yeah, uh, India. Uh, is a maritime power and it's part of the global economy. It benefits from the rules-based world order. And they're no one's fool and don't want to be told what to do. And so they're very reluctant to ally, but they cooperate with things. So this is a big change in recent times. And then Pakistan has its own sets of, of uh, problems. And now that we're out of Afghanistan, that whole mess is their mess, and anyone who's bordering on that mess is consumed with the mess. And oh, the, Afghanistan being one of the most interior positions in the entire surface of the globe, some, uh, a place that's least accessible to maritime power. But anyway, um, I think um, uh, all sorts of prospects for more and more cooperation with India. Admiral Harris? Yeah, so um, I agree with everything Dr. Payne said in that regard. I'll add to it that we are our own worst enemy when it comes to many international relations, but especially with India and Pakistan. You know, we had the Pressler Amendment uh, for all the right reasons, the outcome of which we lost over a generation of Pakistani officers trained in, in U.S. institutions of military higher learning, the war colleges uh, and the like. And we passed the CATSA, that's the Countering America's Adversaries um, Through Sanctions Act against countries who are dealing with Russia for all the right reasons, the outcome of which India, which has 75% of their equipment, uh, come, their military hardware comes from Russia. We punish them or threaten to punish them, uh, and yet we want to open up our markets to India uh, and vice versa. You know, they have the world's second largest C-17 fleet, for example. Uh, so cats have hurt us in our relationships, uh, in our relationship with India and our ability to influence India. You know, I talked earlier, I mentioned the, the, my pet phrase, you know, diplomats and diplomacy matter. Uh, we haven't had an ambassador in India now since January of 2021. And we wonder why India doesn't take a stronger stance against Russia. You know, we have to put diplomats, uh, Senate confirmed ambassadors at post because they matter. They matter to the countries that we're in, that, that they're not in, and they matter to us uh, as a nation. Uh, India has its own challenges. Uh, you know, they have this make in India policy, uh, which is hard. If you want to sell uh, F-35s, for example, in India, it's hard to make them in India. So, you know, that's, that's a case of, of uh, India being its own worst enemy in, in, in this regard. On the Quad, I'm a huge fan of the Quad. I argued for its re-instantiation uh, re at the 2016 Rising Dialogue. The Quad matters. Uh, and, you know, the first big issue that the Quad took on under the Biden administration was uh, vaccine distribution. Uh, how cool is that? So the Quad is not a military thing. It's not a, uh, it's not a NATO or anything like that. But it is focused on, on the PRC. You know, I've joked about the Big Ten has, what, 14 teams and the Big 12 has 10 teams, at least now. Uh, that doesn't mean the Quad has to have four teams. So, you know, we ought to be open to other countries <laughs> joining uh, the Quad. South Korea comes to mind, Indonesia comes to mind, the, the UK comes to mind. So, you know, so I'll stop there. Question over here, sir. Uh, Commander James DeFrancy, I'm a member of the Institute uh, from Colorado. Uh, my question relates back to what uh, Admiral Harris said a few moments ago about the President's assertion that we will be prepared to defend Taiwan uh, in the event of intervention from Beijing. But my question lies in the legality of that or the basis of that under international law and international convention, given that the Qing Dynasty took over China, uh, Taiwan rather, in the 1600s. Uh, the Japanese got it by secession from China in 1895. It went back 
to being Chinese post-World War II. Indeed, our government recognized Taiwan as the seat of the Republic of China for 25 years until Nixon and Kissinger went, and then we entered into the current accords, which had a very ambiguous uh, explanation or allusion to uh, Taiwan being Chinese. So um, uh, they're only recognized as an independent country by 14 nations in the world, all of whom are minor. So the, other than our dependence on chips coming out of Taiwan, well, what's the basis for our interven intervening as the president has asserted? And if my history is incorrect, I stand to be corrected. Uh, I'll, I'll start, the, and then I'll, I'll pass off to someone who probably knows more the historical context than I do. But this is a history conference. So we're not obligated to defend Taiwan. We are obligated to provide for uh, Taiwan to defend itself under the Taiwan Relations Act. I mean, that's the, that's the law of the land. That law was passed, I think, in 1979 or so. Uh, and that's the law under which all the activities we have with Taiwan go forward. We do believe in and are committed to the one China policy. Uh, but the Taiwan Relations Act says that we would support a peaceful reunification of Taiwan uh, and China, but we object to any forceful uh, reunification of Taiwan by China. Uh, and I think that would form the legal basis uh, to go forward to defend Taiwan. Um, I'll stop there. Yeah, maybe else? if I could jump in. I mean, the um, building on what Admiral Harris said, I mean, my understanding is officially the United States does not take a, a position on the disposition of Taiwan. So our position is ambiguous. We don't necessarily regard it as part of China. In the, in the three communiques, we've acknowledged that Chinese on both sides of the uh, strait, you know, regard it as part of China. But that's, that's an ambiguous position. I would say, look, ultimately this is not, shouldn't be decided by, by legality, right? I mean, technically, our, our many of our alliance commitments don't actually obligate us to come fully to the defense of other countries. They're consistent with our constitutional processes and so forth. If you look at the treaty with Manila, for instance, or, or I believe South Korea itself, um, obviously there's an expectation, though, that we would, and that's the key thing. The reason to defend Taiwan, if you're interested, I had a piece in Time magazine, I think last week or two weeks ago about it, is very much in, in American interests. And the semiconductors are part of it, sort of, but really it's much more fundamental. It's about Chinese yeah. control of Asia, which is to say I think that is China's goal, uh, a hegemonic situation, a position over Asia, and then a global preeminence, and it will very directly affect Americans' lives and prosperities and freedoms. And the problem is that Taiwan is both militarily significant, always has been. I mean, it's the unsinkable aircraft carrier of Admiral Leahy, uh, speak historically. But also, it's a huge signal. It's a canary in the coal mine. And whether we like it or not, the president has actually built upon a long legacy, things like the Six Assurances and, and their response to the third Taiwan Straits crisis, expectations among countries in Asia that we would come to Taiwan's defense, that we would not allow it to be subordinated. It's not the same thing as independence for Taiwan, and that doesn't necessitate that we take a formal position of strategic clarity. Because I think at this point, my view is we're actually in a pretty good situation where the Chinese do expect us to come to Taiwan's defense, and other countries are anticipating that. And I think our military increasingly is clear that that's what they should be prepared for. But we're not necessarily poking China in the eye in a kind of public way. But I think you know, if Taiwan were to fall, if we were to give up Taiwan, or if we were to be roundly defeated in a fight, if you're in Manila or Hanoi or, frankly, even Seoul or Tokyo, you're going to look at the United States really differently. And that's just human nature. That's just human behavior, right? Because as, as people regularly say, countries in Asia are wondering whether they should cut a deal with China. Is China just too strong to be resisted? Sure, maybe you'd rather live in a more free, free and open Indo-Pacific. But if your alternative is to get crushed by China and made an example of, you're going to be much more likely to cut a deal. Lee Kuan Yew Somewhat cuttingly, he said about Thailand that they bend before the wind blows. But that's true of a lot of countries in Asia. It's true of human nature in general. So we have to be real clear if we think that we're going to push that line behind and everything is going to go on as, as, we, as we would like. I think that's a delusion. Realistically, if we lose or cut off Taiwan, which is, again, losing Taiwan is, is a real possibility, unfortunately, we are going to have to take much more dramatic action. That's one of the points I'm making here in Europe, is if the Chinese move, it's not like things go on like before, because if you're, we're going to have to compensate. We're going to have to persuade countries to stick with us after we just got smoked, candidly. And that's going to be a, hot, a tall order. So we're going to have to do things that are actually more dramatic in order to compensate for that failure. And that's probably even more the case if we cut them off. Time for one last question uh, okay. over here. 
Glenn Griffith, Naval Institute Press. This is for Dr. Shockey or Dr. Payne. How do China's internal economic issues and concerns limit China's ability to conduct a large-scale invasion of Taiwan that might take a lot of time? Yes, yeah, so we are having a big dogfight about this on the third floor of the American Enterprise Institute. And the, the forces array with Hal Brands and Michael Beckley on one side, their new book, Danger Zone, covers this, where they judge that um, China's economy has stalled and the Chinese government incapable for political reasons of returning to double-digit growth, the policies that would enable double-digit growth. So they're going to mire down in the middle income trap and never approach per capita GDP of the United States or another major power. And for Hal and Michael, that makes them believe that the Chinese leadership sees a closing window of opportunity and therefore, for economic reasons, as much as anything else, they need to move soon on Taiwan. On the other side of this argument, also on the third floor of the American Enterprise Institute, are Derek Scissors and Oriana Schuyler Mastro, who argue they acknowledge the legitimacy of the economic data that Hal and Michael bring, but they argue that China can continue to stall and still be relatively successful for another 30 or 40 years. So there's no near-term trigger economically or politically for China to have to move on Taiwan. And their general belief that America is in terminal decline argues for stretching this out and not going soon. I personally come down on the Hal and Michael side of the argument because if I were China, uh, I would see an eroding strategic position and want to lock in potential gains before people realized I wasn't going to succeed. I, to add to this, it's a good debate. Um, in addition to the double digit growth being over, China has a bunch of only children and it's running out of young people. So if it's going to go, now's when they've got their maximum young people to throw at this thing. But then here's the other observation. So China is not, a mar it can never be a maritime power the way we are by, by geography. Why? Because there's way too many neighbors you have to worry about whether they invade you. And it's surrounded by narrow, shallow, island-cluttered seas with way too many other neighbors so that you cannot reliably get your navy out in wartime. It's not like the west coast where, uh, or the east coast that you just get your navy out in wartime, so, and merchant ships as well. But that being said, Putin has really upset the apple cart because he was basically maintaining a certain level of stability in Central Asia. Xi Jinping took all the money from the double-digit growth and he plopped it on Belt Road, which is crazy, crazy land. Why? Well, I'm a maritime audience. How is it cheaper to ship goods? By trains or by container ships? It's obviously container ships. So he, they've made this massive investment of money that they can't necessarily get back in parts of the world that can't pay them back and now it's been dead-ended. And they can't ignore Central Asia. So we don't know how it's going to blow or not blow. But if it does, Xi Jinping has to pay attention and go in that direction. My suspicion is he'll try to do everything, which is a recipe for overextension. Mm -hmm. And then it goes back to your original questions. OK, what are the opportunities? Watch for the overextension. But they cannot afford to. Their landward borders are primary. And you can see in Ukraine why that is so. <laughs> if bad people come over your borders, it's uh, existential. And China has got to worry about all these things. So we've got all kinds of problems on our plate. I think China has a bigger plate of problems to deal with. Uh, thank you to the audience for the great questions. Before I close the panel, I want to ask Dr. Shockey and any of the other panelists if they have closing thoughts, just uh, last minute parting shots? Uh, yes, I have one, uh, which is the best commentary on American foreign policy ever is from the 1956 or 58 terrible novel, The Ugly American, which contains the great advice on American foreign policy that to the extent American policy is humane and reasonable, it will be successful. And to the extent it is grandiose and ideological, 
it will fail. What the countries of Asia are pleading for us, from for us, is the opportunity for us to craft a strategy that helps us all reduce our reliance on China. And that's what we should be working on as the forefront of our strategy. Thanks. Uh, I was struck by the comments of the French foreign minister who was in Washington uh, this week, and she said, uh, France may be a troublesome ally at times, but France is your ally, speaking to us. And I think that's, that's about right. We need to treat our allies, friends, and partners with respect um, and, uh, and move forward on that basis. Closing remarks. Um, in the October issue of the Journal of Military Affairs, they've published my Marshall Lecture that I gave for the uh, Society of Military History and the Marshall Foundation, and it summarizes my views on what makes continental powers and maritime powers different, and what are the, just the fundamental issues uh, that are separating us. So if you're interested, that's where you can download it. <laughs> I guess just two things. One. Um, it, it's been uh, claimed that Napoleon said this, but don't interrupt your enemies when they're making mistakes. And I think that in both Russia and China, we're seeing leadership making a lot of mistakes right now. Um, and in some ways, that is dangerous because it means that the concentration of power in the hands of people like Vladimir Putin and Xi Jinping uh, raises the risk of miscalculation and uh, some kind of crisis. On the other hand, I think the steps that both Putin and Xi have taken over the past couple of years mean that over the longer term, they're actually weakening their countries and they're weakening their military capabilities. And that mm -hmm. is something that uh, is actually going to benefit us if we can get through this period of crisis. Bridge. Yeah, I'll uh, just briefly, uh, uh, another Napoleon quote that apparently he didn't say, but Xi Jinping likes to quote him. He said that when China rose, the world would quake. I guess what I'd say, kind of stepping back and looking at the conversation more broadly, I think the question is, are we going to be fine kind of going along as we have in the, in the past sort of 20 or 30 years? And my view is that we're facing genuinely unprecedented challenge and that China is a whole different order of magnitude than what we faced before. And it, I, you know, they're clearly facing challenges and will face challenges as, as do we. Um, but we, have, we should see change on the scale uh, of, the, of the scale of the challenge that we're facing. Um, and I don't think we're seeing that. And the administration itself and its national security strategy says that we are in a decisive decade. I, and to put a very fine point on it, I think there is a very real possibility of a war. Not quite for the reasons that Brands and Beckley do, more for the reasons that Oriana and Tom Shugart and others have, have pointed out, although Hal and Mike could be right. But I guess the question is, if we see a major war with China in, an, in a year from now or two years from now, do we feel that we are doing the things to prepare now that are necessary? I don't think so, and I hate to think of that possibility. Wow. Great last words, thank you. Uh, thanks to each of you for taking your time today. This has been a great panel discussion. As a small token of our appreciation, we'd like to present you a Naval Institute Press book, Fire on the Water, second edition, China, America, and the Future of the Pacific by Robert Haddock. Please join me in a round of applause for our panelists. <laughs>